So from the last time I saw you, which was like 10 years ago, you were a personal trainer at a high school. And then now 10 years later, you've got businesses, best-selling books, you're in sci-fi blockbuster films. What do you think are the contributing factors to why you were able to grow and develop yourself both personally and in business in such a short period of time? You've got to find the right people. I mean, it's find role models, not warnings. And you've got to find your tribe, a tribe that inspires you, a group of people where you can say, this is who I want to be around. And for me right now, it's being at Harvard. It's being around the Marines because, um, you know, you're able to be around a group of people that for me holds two to three Fs that I have in my life, which is friends, family, and faith to chase the three things, to always chase friends, to chase family, to chase faith and build that tribe. And, um, you know, you're asking how I went from trainer to, uh, where I am now. Not only is it role models, it's also, um, not always looking for the answer, but, you know, the importance of asking the right questions. Uh, most people are always searching for the right answers rather than asking the right questions. Questions could be, you know, what do I love? What do I want to do? Where do I want to go? Who are the people I want to be around? And then for those quest questions, you create the space for solutions and perspectives, new perspectives to come in. And that starts to broaden, right? So when I first met you, I was a trainer in high school, but I still had dreams. And we talked before that you can have dreams, but don't live in a dream world. So that means, okay, what are the steps I need to do to break down that dream? And it's also really important about, we talked about this in the last podcast, which is knowing and knowing about, finding the right people that truly know a subject, right? They just don't know about it. They read it in a book and say, okay, I know everything about China. Actually, if you haven't lived there, you don't know it. And you will know that yourself in China, you know, there's so many things you would have seen that your friends wouldn't see. But I'd be right in saying that. 100%. What would some of those things be for you? Ah, uh, man, where does it start? Like from when I was living in China and just the experiences I had, the way it was just living there, like it was so much closer. Like people think it's so different. It's like a different planet, right? And it was so much mm -hmm. closer to like every other country. Like there's people, the society works in a certain way. And people would say things to me like, oh man, like everywhere you go, you're like under surveillance and everyone's watching you and, and you can't do anything. And it's like, well, not really. Like I could go outside, hop on my bike, ride around to my friend's place. We'll go eat hamburgers. We'll play basketball or do whatever we want to do. And it's the exact same mm -hmm. childhood in all the different places I've lived from Hong Kong to Dubai, to Sydney, to Beijing. It's the same childhood. Like for me speaking from like, all I know was childhood there, but I didn't see much difference. And there's certain differences culturally, but it's not like this completely different place where like, it almost seems as if people think that Chinese people aren't human in a way. Like they think of them as some other, like it, they just have no idea of what the actual country is like, in my opinion. Exactly. And one of the most interesting things is when I was a kid, and I'm going to tell you how this ties into our film, The Wandering Earth 2, is that I always would pick up something. I said, excuse me, I said to someone, what, what does this mean? Actually, even this one says it made in China. Airs. I'd say, what does this mean made in China? No one could answer the question, right? There were people who knew about it, but no one who knew China, right? Knowing and knowing about. And 18 years later, after being in China, you know, I truly know it. This, I think now touches on the point you asked, Jesse, which is how do you get from that place where you were as a personal trainer now doing films? And of course, it's not just an overnight thing. It's, t it's 10 years, even more actually, of just lots of prep. Mindset is crucial. So, um, you've got to have a positive mindset. You've got to have an empowering mindset. This means that Yes, you're going to have shit. Well, excuse me, bad things happen to you. Excuse my language. And stuff. Bad That's things happen to you. But it's how you can see that as a good, as a positive, how that's going to help your life and move forward. And then it's about taking action. You've always got to take consistent action. And one of the hard things for a lot of people to see with me is you do so much. Um, I don't get it because as I told you before, I never mistake activity for accomplishment. All the action is moving towards a goal. And as we go through this interview, I'll talk more about how that goal works. There's personal development and personal growth. So finding the people that help you. There are people such as Tony Robbins, 
person called Peter Sage, all these different people that you go on my Instagram, you'll see how they've influenced my life and put me in the right direction. Got to focus on your psychology, relationships and connections. All of this stuff, as you do it in your personal life, it's exactly what we have to do on set. When we're working on a film set, when you're working with people, when you're working with your character. And, um, and, and by the way, feel free to chip in, you know, if you have questions yourself, because this, I was hoping this would just be a conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that carried on from Cambridge, now here at Harvard. Um, and as you can see in the background, I'm not sure if the audience can see. Yeah, you can see but, it. But, uh, this is, this is where everyone is graduating tomorrow. And for me, I always had the dream of coming here to Harvard. It was always my dream, but I didn't live in a dream world. I had to say, okay, realistically, it's going to cost a lot of money. I'm going to have to get my grades up. I'm going to have to get an undergraduate degree. I'm going to have to work on getting a master's. Later on, I want to move into a PhD or we call a DBA, which is a doctor of business administration because an education, Mandela said it before Nelson Mandela, it sets you free. It empowers you. It's something no one else can take away from you. And I know from the stunt world of doing acting, an action sequences and you break bones and hurt yourself, you really start to say, okay, do I have something I can, you know, go to? And right now being here at Harvard for me, based on all the personal development and growth I've gone through, it's the perfect time because I know who I am. So I know how to maximize this beautiful educational opportunity and the same one in Cambridge and then make it relevant to life, make it relevant to film. Yeah. I mean, there's something there as well that you said about, you know, finding your role models and finding people that can shape your life and impact your life. Uh, how much of that is, I guess, knowing your strengths and trying to find a way to get in contact with them? Because so many people I think would see someone like, I would like them to be a role model to me, but oh, I don't know them personally. How do I even reach out? Or they would think, oh, maybe it's just not in the cards for me. I just won't even bother trying. So how do you, you know, like get in contact? I, I get. So you've asked a great question. The first thing is that most people want the answers. I want to meet this person. I want to be around them. But if you remember what I said before, it's about asking the right questions that get the right answers. Most people want the answer, but the question getting to your point is I would ask myself, how do I get around these people? What are the steps? What are the actions I need to do to be in that group to get around those people? And they would always, you know, lead to an answer. For example, um, with all the actors or my first clients in China, I would say to myself, um, what do I need to do right now to get in that perfect presence? I actually remember with my first client, they're in a stadium. And I said, you just need to get up there. You just need to get through the crowd. Will I am was playing a concert in Beijing at the Olympic Stadium. And I said, okay, I remember I was sitting way back in the back row. And I saw the people I wanted to work with and I went, okay, I'm here. They're over there. What steps do I need to do to get there and just go? It's like going down, going down a slope. When you go down a ski slope, you can't think about it. You just got to do it. You just got to go. And this is for me. I use it in acting. I use it for life. But in that process, I asked three questions before I do it. We talked about this with our Harvard professor to take that step. You need to shed something. You need to let go of this limitations you need to shed your skin then you start to say okay well this made me better what do i need to do to be better go do it and just by that process of taking those steps forward you know you meet those people and if your intent is pure you have a good intent you know what you want it leads to good behavior so most people care about okay i just want all of this stuff yes but look at your behaviors and before your behaviors look at your intent you know what is your intention for this why are you doing it this is so important actually in acting we always talk about what is the intent? Why are you doing what you're doing? Because if you have great intent, you have great behavior, which leads to great impact. And therefore, you have great influence on people and great influence on performance. And that's what we want. We want that connection. We want that great performance. But so often, we're focusing on the end result rather than thinking about what will leave us there. Great intent. And, if you have, and with great intent, you can create the great questions. So you're someone who has a really positive mindset. And like you said before in this interview, that when you see someone that you want to get around and learn from, you just go for it and you think, okay, how can I get there? And you'll ask yourself those positive questions. You'll give yourself positive reinforcement to just go after it. Was there ever a point in your life where you didn't have that as an initial reaction, where your first reaction was maybe negative and you thought, well, I can't achieve this or 
you just weren't so positive. And if there was a point in time where you were like that, how did you break out of that mindset? So one of the times I remember distinctly was uh, when my my father passed away. So when my dad passed away, I just felt that everything was the end. I just felt life was the end. I didn't want to do anything. I had no motivation. And I thought to myself, I, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. And I broke out of it two ways. One is I remember asking the right question, which was, uh, you know, who are the people I need to find? Who are the people I need to get around? And I remember type of my name, Tony and motivation on the internet and up, up came Tony Robbins. And then I realized with him, he just, he blew me away. Everything he was saying, I thought, this guy is speaking my language, a language of the mind, a language of the heart, a language of the gut, where it was all coming together. And then, um, as I've got to know myself, and it's still the case today, that I call it uh, enlightened trial and error and see which sticks. Okay? Enlightened trial and error and see which sticks. I don't know the answer to everything, but I'll try things out. If they don't work, okay, that doesn't work, but this works. Why does this work? And then start going down deep, deep down the process and say, oh, it works because of this. It works because of that. Yeah. And uh, to me, Tony Robbins is someone who, like, when you really listen to him, he's not one of those people that just gives you, you know, motivation after motivation that then fizzles out after like five seconds of listening to him speak. He speaks to a deeper part of your brain. For sure. And I definitely yeah. feel that when listening to Tony Robbins and watching interviews with him is he's someone who truly understands the mind and continues to, uh, to, to work in his life to understand it even better. Like he continues to push even further to understand it. But I do feel like there are some people where they wouldn't even listen to Tony Robbins. They would just think, oh, he's one of those people telling you to think positively. I don't believe it. Where in, in my yeah. opinion, I feel like with those types of messages, you have to buy in. You have to completely yeah, yeah. buy in and just say to yourself, no, this does work. Because almost yeah. everyone who's achieved something has said the same stuff. Think positively, you know, go after it, be optimistic. Uh, how do you break out of that mindset of being someone to just go, no, I don't want to listen. It wouldn't work for me. So this is a process where, again, it's about finding people that resonate with you. Not everyone's going to resonate. And I appreciate that Tony doesn't resonate with everyone. Neither do I resonate with everyone either. So first of all, you've got to find again, your tribe, which I talked about in the beginning. So my tribe is Harvard Business School, Cambridge, the Royal Marines, and finding that group of people. And then just asking, you know, who are you talking to? What are you looking at? Um, because, you know, from that person, uh, from that process, you start finding out, Oh, uh, this person works for me. This person doesn't work for me. And, it depends on your definition of success. What is success for you? For me, um, success is having fulfillment because success without fulfillment, which in my case is having love in your life, that's failure. Okay. So find people that have done that, that have had more than just a success. They've had impact on people. They're growing, they're contributing way beyond themselves. And they have those three values that I look for friends, family, and faith. And everything is working in their life that it's like, wow, this is, this is impressive. And they've also been the journey. We talked about this before. It's not about the destination. It's not about, okay, I want to get here and that's it. No, because it's the journey, the, the journey there. You learn so much about who, yourself and Shakespeare talked about this to thine own self be true. Well, you know, once you start knowing yourself, it comes back to the questions, these, these powerful questions I said at the beginning. What do I need to shed? What can I do to be better? And what do I need to start doing? And I found personally that Tony Robbins, he was one of those people that was doing that. And I'd seen the impact and change in other people. So I said, okay, this is someone who's an example of that. And it comes back to role model versus warning. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about before in a little bit on our last conversation about detaching yourself, right? Don't be attached to something. How do you sort of let go and and just sort of lose yourself in in faith in the universe? You know, just sort of uh, detaching yourself from from needing something and just putting faith out there that it will happen. That's a great question. It's very deep, and there's a lot of books I recommend people look at. 
for me, there's, um, you know, uh, the power of now by, uh, Eckhart Tolle. Um, there's some great books by Dr. David Hawkins. Uh, and I, and you can leave links in for that, uh, into this podcast for people to go deeper and do a deeper dive into that, which an answer to that question, you do need a deeper dive. And as I said at the beginning, those people gave me motivation. One of them is, um, you know, like an emotional release. So looking deep down at the emotions you have going on inside and trying to say, what is that? Why do you have that emotion? Why do you hold on to it? Like for me, uh, when I lost my father, I knew I had so much trauma and so much kind of emotion that was trapped in myself, but I didn't know. And, and it was only talking to people such as Tony and going through a process to understand it and say, wow, what is the thing that most held, I felt at the time held me back has become one of the most enlightening things because I was able to release that emotion, which I said the first part is, you know, release it, acknowledge what it is, and then have an acceptance of it and surrender to it. And most people are just holding on to everything, holding, holding on, holding on. And as a result, because they can't let go, it shows, shows in their body, they're tight. Uh, some of the people that I work with, um, Larry Moss, phenomenal coach in acting, he calls it the power of intent. And whenever you're performing a scene, whenever you have that, just that, that moment where you stop or you pause, it's some emotion you're holding back. And once you go deep and process it and realize, you know, <laughs> Again, that like Shakespeare said, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm. And the Chinese talk about this in their wisdom. Everything just is. It's just that we hold on to these emotions. We, I know because I've been there. And then, you know, it's, there's a process of it. Um, there is the identification of ego. You know, whenever you feel ego coming in, where you say, I'm the best, I'm this and that. That's when I find, especially, and I've been there before where I always wanted to be number one, the best. And I got humbled in China. I got humbled in business, in life, with friends, the language, in film. That when I let go of my ego and just let go and say, just, just drop it. Very powerful. And forgiveness. Forgiveness is another one. Uh, again, you can put a link into this. It's called the Hopa Uno. It's a Hawaiian verse, which is four sayings. And I found this to be very powerful in terms of letting go and, and letting go for yourself and other people to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And it's a very, and the more you say it, it's very, it's so empowering inside. We talked about before intent, behavior, impact to get to pure intent. You need to let go of whatever you've got going on. Cause if the intent is not right, it'll affect behavior. Behavior affects impact, impact on the people and performance will show up. Go back to the intent. You try it yourself. Try it now. If you go, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. Go on, try it. See how you feel. Say those words. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I th thank you. And I love you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, exactly. saw, I was like, I was going to say, I thank you. <laughs> but yeah, but it does. It right? just makes you feel good. Because you're saying- Exactly. Yeah. Just on like a, a deeper human level that is just, I find detached from ego. You know, saying things like it's that- time. Thank you. I love yeah. you. That's, there's no ego involved in those words. And I, and, I, and, I, and I have to realize, you know, this both in business and film, whenever I've needed to be right, I've caused more pain for myself and others. But the minute I let go of that and say, you know what? I haven't thought about that. You know, you, you make a great point. Um, thank you for that. I, you know, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Mm -hmm. Now that moment, say I love you. And then builds into the next part, which is, there's this growth going on, this spiritual growth, whether it's surrendering to a higher power, realizing the intelligence of the universe in China. For me, it's been based around uh, what they call Yuanfen. Yuanfen is this, this sense of serendipity, that things all happen to you, that once you open to the universe and let go of yourself and realize you're not the drop, but you're the ocean, right? You're part of this one big collective. Everything starts working for you. But once you're the ego, you know, the ego is the drop of water thinking it's the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> right? And when you think about that, you go, that's, that's ludicrous. But there are some people that think like that. Mm -hmm. And that again comes back to how do you find the right people? Make sure you're around people that if that's the type of person you are, which I am very heart driven, be around those because it then builds into my next point, which is finding truth and integrity. 
and finding people who really they you know there's they want to develop that truth they want to develop that integrity in themselves and i've seen this very very clearly in the marines i see it very clearly here at harvard business school in the values that drive you and once you're there you're in the present moment and if you're in the present moment the relationships you have are built on this awareness of just being in the moment that being you know this that's love that that is what makes a great film yes. which we're going to get onto right so you're just so in the moment people say oh my gosh you know and then you want to go back to the film so you can get back to that moment yeah and i feel those moments are created from love which is talking you know about films being a love letter to the genre but yeah. i think that is so so important in film yeah and and like i was thinking that as you were saying that that my favorite actors my favorite movies are ones that aren't trying to do it right. They're not trying to like get to a, an end result. They're not trying to have a direct impact on someone. They're just going through, ha- putting faith in the universe, being completely truthful, being detached from ego in the moment. However, it comes out, it comes out and just reacting, right? Like the best actors are exactly. reactive. The best films are ones that they're not pre, they're not pre planning an emotion from the audience which I see a bit now, like you see, like anytime you've read a bad book or seen a bad movie or a bad speech, you know, it's when they're, you can tell they're trying to elicit an emotion. They're not speaking from a place of truth. And the people that impact you the most are people that come from a place of truth. Exactly. And and getting to that truth is what makes things great. makes your relationships great. And it's hard to get to. It's not easy, you know. It's not like put chat GPT and say, "Hey, give me the truth." <laughs> <laughs> it, it might tell you how to do it, but you've got to do the work, right? Which comes back to what I said: shed the skins, do better. Now start doing it, right? Yeah. It's in the doing that things happen. And, you and know, I'm not here. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go. You go on. Finish your point. I was going to say I'm not here because of privilege or anything. I don't come from any privilege. It's just by doing. And the more you do, the more you know. You know about who? Yourself. And you learn how much you don't know. So then you humble, lower your ego, and be like the Chinese say, the most powerful force in the world, which is the ocean. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So and you learn to remain alone. And you touched on a great point just before about love letters to film. And uh, we talked exactly. about this on a phone call about how uh, Tom Cruise's Top Gun Maverick was just a love letter to aviation and a love letter to movies. Exactly. And I don't know if it played in your cinema, but before I watched it in the cinema, there was a message from Tom Cruise saying like, thank you yeah. for being in the cinema and bringing back movies. And, you know, it's important. Exactly. And like, they're just, they're the best movies to me. Ones that are, if you're in the sci-fi genre, they're honoring the fans of sci-fi, honoring the genre and just cu- coming from a complete place of love for that specific genre. Is that the most exactly. important part of film for you? For me, it's 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 the most important part. That's what I realized with Wandering Earth. Wandering Earth 2 is my third film. And I love the first one because it was that. It was a love letter to the genre. And then once I saw it, it's um, there's a part of the brain that they call the RAS, which they call the Reticular Activating System. You can check it out on Wikipedia. R-A-S, Reticular Activating System. And that's where you see something like a pair of shoes or the car you drive you see it everywhere it was always there but you now see it all the time in terms of the film once i understood love letters i knew films that were a love letter to that genre and the ones that weren't and the ones that weren't that were so generic cookie cutter maybe they put it to chat gpt and it came out it just it, I, it, I didn't have any feeling there and it's because once you break it down everything great you know if you break it down you can see patterns everything's about pattern identification there's authenticity it's authentic there's the essence and the spirit there to the genre but wondering enough too it was science fiction and then there's a homage there's an homage to the classics right incorporating subtle references that people say wow that's very interesting there's so many things um about a wondering earth too that people say it's like the space odyssey and it's this elements of star trek and there's AI. There's so many deep references there. Then you have um, mastering the craft. There's this, you know, there's huge technical skill going on. When I arrived there, our director, incredible at understanding, you know, storytelling from an inno- innovation perspective, whilst also having uh, strong characters. Characters like 
Andy Lau, who's been in China for decades, a huge star. Wu Jing, bringing them together, the visual style, the coloring, just like Avatar, the emotional connection, and most important, also respecting the fans. The fans wanted something where they could just be lost in the moment and touch on so many things we experience today in society, which is the innovation and the evolution. That's the love letter. That's what Tom Cruise just hit on the head. And everyone, when I ask people, what did you feel a Top Gun? I have people that don't like anything to do with the military that go, amazing. I was just like, wow, you know, there. Yeah. So. And, and Top Gun came at a time where I think we really needed that. And I think people were yeah. forgetting uh, uh, what those types of films could be because we hadn't seen one in a little while. And so watching that, it was just such a breath of fresh air. But one thing that I also uh, really love about those types of films, and, and it's a big part of Wandering Earth as well, is service. How can we best serve others, serve the world, serve cinema? And it seems that's what movies have always been. And art as a whole has been an act of service, right? To try and add mm. something to the world that can improve people's lives or just an act of service of, uh, as a director of being the best director for your actors, like just from the small bits to the large bits, just being an act of service. Do you think that maybe social media or celebrity or money or anything gets in the way of service sometimes? I think it, yes, it does. It does. If you don't know who you are, if you allow other people to guide your decisions, to guide your thought process. Um, and, you know, if you don't know who you are, then everyone else will tell you who you are and lead you in a direction where you might one day end up saying, this is, this is not where I want to be. And, and to your question, which is about service and, you know, films having a bigger impact on people, it comes back to storytelling. And the minute a story is inauthentic and it's told by an inauthentic person, the message can be skewed up. And when the message is skewed up, that has an impact on people. So it's very important that for me, any project I do, it's not just in film, in life, I always come back to two things. Am I growing and am I contributing? Am I growing as a person to be a role model and am I contributing? And from those two places, you automatically have serviced others. And when you have serviced others, it's such a rewarding feeling to see other people grow because you've helped them. And film can do that. I saw that in my own life with Keanu Reeves in The Matrix. I've seen that with all the greats, which are a love letter to the genre. Mm. Anything that's not ever worked out, it's always just been a little bit off point. Mm. Say, I don't know what that is. And it comes back to what I said, which is the RAS. Once you start seeing it everywhere, you go, that's not a love letter. There's yeah. a reason why certain people keep making the best films. Why do certain directors keep doing it? Because they understand to stay true to the principles and don't go off, right? There's a, something that's worked that is creating that love letter. And a lot of it also comes back to education. Once you're around people that are smarter than you, it humbles you. It comes back to what we talked about, which is, you know, not just about letting go, but letting go of ego mm -hmm. and letting go of the fact that don't try and be right. Just be open. You mm -hmm. have one mouth, two ears. Use the mouth less, use the ears more. Yeah, you touched on it there. I was about to ask you about ego because it definitely comes back to that because I feel like when you're leading with ego, it can be enticing to be like, oh, well, if I do this, which is maybe maybe bad for people or it might not be an act of service, it might not be progressing you, but you, it can be enticing to go, if I do this, I'll gain this back or I'll get this success or I'll get this monetary value, whatever. Uh, how do exactly. you- when you start getting success, how do you navigate that and make sure that you're not losing yourself in the ego? Because I've also found with myself, there are times where the ego can lie to you. And there are certain films mm -hmm. that touch on this too. The ego can lie to you and make it feel like you're doing something good when in reality, you're only doing it for yourself and it's bettering no one else. So how do you keep that ego in check? What are, what are tools that you do on a daily basis, no matter how small, how big, that keep your ego in check. So this is super important because it comes down to first, you know, first an awareness of just having an ego is really important. Checking yourself and go, okay, am I, uh, is this an ego? And so as a great acronym I heard for ego, which is edging God out, right? <laughs> you know, it's very just edging God out. But um, in terms of ego, 
you know, just having the awareness of it. And if you know your values, like the things you value, that can, that can help you move away from that. But you've got to do dig deep and get down to do the work of values. And what I have is I have a hierarchy of values in terms of the values that for me are incredibly important. And the reason I signed on to be here at Cambridge, at uh, Harvard Business School here and the University of Cambridge and the Maroons because of the values. For me, my hierarchy of values go like so. Love, love what you do. Trust, respect, humility, integrity, excellence, self-discipline. And then what I learned here at business school, for example, Harvard Business School, intellectual curiosity, critical thinking, collaboration, integrity, inclusion and diversity, personal growth, service, leadership, excellence. Mm. These are things that are also, they, and they cross over. They're the same in the War Marines. Courage. And one thing people notice about me is I'm always cheerful, always happy. Because when I was at Limpston a couple of weeks ago before the King's coronation, it's where all the Marines are trained in England, I saw the values up there and I said to myself, I've been living my life like that in many tough situations. Cheerfulness in the face of adversity, unselfishness, commitment. And if you know me back then when we first met, as you see me, you can say, yeah, that's exactly Tony. Yeah. If I write those values down and give them to all my classmates, the ones that know me, they'll say, yeah, that's Tony. Yeah. If you were to guess who that person was, that's Tony. Now, how do you get rid of ego? Once you know your values and you put them in a hierarchy, then you clarify what they mean to you, the, dis- the direction, you know, why they're important, the direction they're going to take you in life. And then you align them up with your purpose. My purpose is to bring health and wellness to people all around the world. And let them be the hero of their own health journey. Right. And that's what film is. It's the hero of a thousand faces, turning people into their own hero. Mm-hmm. So with my values, I'm able to bring that to film. I'm able to align up with my purpose. And here's the key. Effective decision making. I can make good decisions because I, I measure all my decisions with my values. And then I sleep good at night. I have personal empowerment and then I resolve any conflict. Anytime I have conflict, or egos creeping in, it's probably because, or I know it's because I haven't aligned with my values, or there's a conflict somewhere, or there's a value that needs reassessing. Mm. For example, I would say back in my early 20s, it was all about business, making money. And, and, and I thought that was the top value. Actually, it wasn't. What's led by life, all the best things in my life, love. Mm. And then once you have that, you resolve conflict, you resolve ego, you prioritize your time. This time is precious. Three things you can't buy. Time, health, and love. Time, health, and love. You can't buy those. And now you have self-awareness. Now you're growing. So as I stand here with this amazing graduation here at Harvard Business School, I hope one day I would you know, come here as an MBA student. But many mm. years later in my life, I'm here. But I'm here without the ego. And I know my values. And I know the order in which... They drive me to do incredible things, incredible things where people say, how did you do that? How did you get to that place? And they say, you do so much. Again, that's another thing. It was, you do so much. I just don't get it. I don't get it. And I said, it's because, again, I do not mistake activity for accomplishment. Mm. And that's what most people are. They're, they're, they're doing, 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 but doing nothing. They're achieving nothing. And then to tie it all back in, once you have the piece of your values together. Now you can align it with three things you talked about before, which is your gut, your heart, and your head. You can measure up and say, okay, in my gut, based on my expertise, my skills, my creativity and experience, does it all align with my values? Yes. Good. Now my heart, with my passion, with my energy and the things I love and that feel fun to me, do the values align at this moment with what I'm doing? Yes. In my head, and we do a lot of, you know, work here at uh, Harvard Business School with case studies and analytical thinking for our businesses and our individual, what we're doing to change the world and become leaders in our strategic thinking, in our positioning, in our capabilities, our goals and performance. I measure them all up with my values. And if gut, heart, head or all in alignment, perfect. 
It mm. honestly is. And I don't even think about it like in terms of questioning it. It's just flowing. Yeah. And like you touched on there with you're at Harvard Business School, you're doing like it, it almost seems like a bit of a contradiction, right? Like you don't come across many blockbuster action stars who are going to Harvard <laughs> Business School or also at Cambridge, also running uh, health and uh, health uh, businesses who went to China at 18. Like your life is like this walking contradiction, but what ties it all together is you <laughs> and you living your truth and staying true to your values. How do you manage exactly. your time on a daily basis? What are your tangible steps to like, keeping track of being a movie star, a Harvard Business oh. School student? Like, how do you manage that? Great, great question. Um, so the, I use systems. The two systems I recommend. One of them is called Getting Things Done. It's called the GTD, GTD Method. Uh, you can do a short video on YouTube or you can read the book. And then I bring together what? Uh, Tony Robbins taught me and his system's called RPM, which is result focused, purpose driven, massive action plan. So with everything I want in life, now I know my values. Now I know who I am. And I'm sure that will evolve as you go through our trials and tribulations in life because we're all going to experience pain. And it's through the pain and digging deep on what that is and overcoming it that we might change the direction where we go. Yet having systems like the GTD method, like Tony's RPM, I'm able to manage everything. For example, with both of these methods, you learn to capture everything down. So just everything that's on your mind, what you got to do, write it down, write it down, write it down, write it down. And then you start blocking everything, right? And you create a system, start organizing it. And then when you want to start organizing it, you clarify, okay, what links up to my passion? What links up to my vision and what I want to do? And if it doesn't, put it aside. And then start working out the actions I start needing to do to take that. To take that, you know, to what are the actions I need to do to get me closer to my vision? And I have both a journal I keep that I showed at the beginning and also create a vision wall where I put everything up on my wall and say, these are the things I want to achieve. This is why I want to achieve it and start seeing and feeling the life I want. And then here's the key. I just let go and trust the process. Trust that I know the systems without constantly chasing it. And this is why I bring in a lot, which we can touch on in a moment, um, is the Chinese philosophy. But here's another thing is reviewing it regularly and having someone to hold you accountable. So I have a few coaches that I sit with and go through everything and they get me to see the unseen, things I haven't thought about. And then I always prioritize things. So I want to try and get things done every day. I know I can't get everything done. And it's basic methodology of RPM and GTD. You can Google both of them. For me, the most powerful has been Tony's, which is results focused, purpose driven, massive action plan. For example, uh, every day I work out. Okay. I know my result. Today I want to do a few thousand push ups. Why? Because I love it. Cause it'll keep me in shape. It'll keep me strong. If I'm doing stunts, action sequences, I get punched and knocked around. My body's going to be strong. Okay. That's, that's what I told my result. What's my purpose? Now what I got to do? Just got to do the push ups. And then I got to break it down. You obviously not going to do a thousand push-ups in one go, but you can break it down into 50 push-ups, 25 push-ups, and then you got to start writing. You have to write it down. There's no way you can keep all the things we've talked about today. I have to sit down and write out, okay, this is what I want to talk to Jesse about. And then we could just see how the conversation flows. There has to be an element of flowing where it's not forced, but you need to write it down. Mm. Otherwise, um, you can't remember it all. So... We're at a time right now where a lot of people map out their time schedule for a day, right? This is my work schedule. And like you said, a lot of it's about uh, actions, but no results, right? They're not result focused. They're, they're confusing action with achievement. And I find so many times I watch YouTube videos on productivity and stuff. People go, oh, I'm up at 5 a.m. And from 5 to 7, I do this. And from 7.30 to 9.30, I do this. And then it's like, okay, you're doing a lot. But what are you actually achieving? Like, I would much rather a productivity schedule that showed me, okay, I'm getting this, this, and this done today. Not from this time to this time, I'm working on this. And then from this time to this time, I'm working on that. Like, you're not achieving anything. You're just sort of ticking away very slowly at different stuff at different times of the day. And I think this ties into like work-life balance as well. Uh, what's your take on work-life balance? As someone who achieves a lot, does way more than the average person, What's your take on the whole work-life balance argument and what is work-life balance to you? 
First of all, it comes back to knowing your dream of what you want. So if you make a plan without without a dream, it's kind of like when I ask people, what are you shooting for? And they say, I don't, I'm just not shooting for anything, right? So if you don't have a target, and you just end up missing nothing, you hit nothing. So I always ask people, what's their dream? What do you want? What do you want to achieve? What if, I always want to have a happy life. Okay, what does that mean? Break it out for me. Let me understand it. Let me hear your story. I usually have to get people to go back to the very beginning of their story and then find out what they um what they love, the things that influence them. The values is a huge part. And then once you have that dream and what what your dream is, what you value, what you're passionate about, now you can start saying, okay, these are the things I'd like to achieve, right? If you achieve them or don't achieve them, great. But it's the journey there that you'll be, you know, in that process of saying, you know what, I'm going towards a vision. They say it in the Bible. Those that are the people that have vision or without a vision, people perish, right? You've got to have a vision just for something. It'll change or adapt because that you go on that journey. Now you've had the vision comes back to what I said, which is you have a dream, but don't live in a dream world. Don't live in a dream world. You know that these are the steps I need to take to get to that dream. And it starts with getting very clear on the dream. And every day you've got to write down all the things I want to do. And, People write a to-do list, but you have to break the to-do list down into chunks. And say, so, okay, what what are these things going to achieve, right? If I do all this different type of exercise, my exercise is very specific. A lot of it's towards stunts and film and action choreography, which requires me to be more flexible, more subtle, more supple. So I do more yoga, more push-ups, more pull-ups, uh, a lot more stunt choreography as opposed to heavy, super deadlift weights. Again, why? Because I know where I'm going as an action performer. I know the films I want to work in, why I'm doing it, because it aligns with my values. It aligns with my dream of, you know, showing people they can be the hero of their own story and inspire people to be healthy. Okay. That's my dream. Now, it, you know, once I break it down, I say, okay, my workout now is yoga, push ups, pull ups, not heavy weights, because that plan is very specific towards the dream. But if you, you know, most people, when they go to the gym, I know they want to lose weight, but why? Why do you want to get there? What do you want to achieve? And uh, for me, it's always about health first before the fitness piece, because it's much more long term. I found all the great things in life are based upon getting in the game and staying in the game. The greatest athletes, you're looking at a Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Cristiano Ronaldo. These guys have gotten the game and they've stayed in the game. And I've seen them uphand. First, I've seen these people, you know, First hand, and I said, wow, that's because they got in the game, they stayed in the game. Keanu Reeves is a great example of that. Decades, decades, right? And through many genres, but he had a vision. They all have a vision. And if you look at great movies, John Wick, he has a vision mm. in his films. Um, Avatar, James Cameron, Christopher Nolan. These are great films, right? Mm. So get your dream and then don't live in a dream world. Start breaking it down. And then... It, it makes sense. Otherwise, you're just going to get lost. Yeah. <laughs> and this is where it's very important to start really understanding yourself and going deep on. Um, for me, I know that Chinese culture is a huge part of who I am. That's why I focused on Chinese film, um, how I bring together aspects of Chinese culture that have made me the person I am today and drive many of the decisions. And I'm talking about the deep, rich, thousands and thousands of year old culture that shaped me as a person. They shape all my decisions, you know, in terms of not forcing things and flowing with nature. And a lot of people, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll touch on it in a bit here with film, but it's all linked together. You just got to study, you got to do the work and, and not always, you know, try and swim upstream, try and flow with it. Be mm. a bit more like Bruce Lee, right? Yeah. And something that's important Water becomes the cup. Exactly. You touched on it there with Chinese culture. And I always found, uh, you know way more than me about it, but I always found with Chinese culture, the balance was internal. It was an internal balance within you. Yeah. There's a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. I see in the West about finding balance is like, okay, uh, you got 24 hours in a day, four hours must be this, four hours is that. But it's like, that's balanced everywhere else but yourself. You're not balancing yourself. And like you said, the best actors, the best directors, the best athletes are the ones that are in the game and stay in the game. Because they're balancing mm -hmm. themselves. They're not trying to achieve something externally like I make three films and then get to this place and then I do two films and get here. It's like 
I'm just going to keep making movies because I love it. And that's what keeps me centered. That's my value. That's my, my passion and purpose. Um, yeah. W- what are your takes on, on like Chinese culture there about finding the balance in you and having that as your driving force, not your balance everywhere else in life? It, it took me many years to get this in China because I came from the West with a West mindset to an Eastern mindset. And I thought to myself, wow, we are so developed and they're developing. And actually, I learned the opposite, which is what China's taught me, is that black and white, high and low, left and right, you know, developing or developed, which is it? And I thought, you know, when I lived um, very poor university, uh, eight, eight people per room, um, limited electricity, everyone studied incredibly hard. You know, it's like uh, $1 a day for three meals. You know, when you have that experience, are they really developing or are they developed? I would say they're developed because they're humble. Humble people are very powerful people because they're not driven by ego. They're driven by a collectiveness to help each other, be, be responsible, not think about yourself. And this is where the depth of Chinese culture started to really... Um, it started to become part of me. When I returned back to the West, everyone said, you, you, you're different. You're just different. And I said, yeah, because, you know, my way is not the right way, right? There's just, you know, this is where we'll talk about a little bit on terms of the Tao, which is really influenced me. It's 81 verses. But I'll go to, I'll go to film, for example, because we're talking about film. I found the historical depth in Chinese cinema very powerful. There's um, a one called Sanguo, which is Three Kingdoms. And there's so many uh, stories within China that have defined their culture. So that, for me, was fascinating because it's thousands of years old. There's the cultural diversity. There's so many different ethnic groups. You can go to the south in China, to the north. I've been to every province. In 18 years, I've been to every province in China. And every custom is different. Yes, they all speak with Hua, right? And I can... Okay, sure, don't worry, man, too, right? I can speak the Chinese, but each province has a different dialect. I'll give you an example. So I speak Chinese, but on which is, go morning, chival mail. Have you had some food? But in Chaozhou, in the south, in near Hong Kong, they will say, totally different. It's more of a nasal, nasal one. So there's a the cultural diversity. There's the visual splendor that all the provinces have all these different Types of architecture, styling and clothes. There's the symbolism, huge symbolism. Everything, as I look closer, I say, wow, there is deep meaning here. And then there's the wisdom, the philosophical depth in, in everything they do. And I said, wow, it's changing me because I didn't think like that. You know, it's, it's in, when I was at school in England or in America, it was chase, 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 go for the goal, get it, get it, get it. But in China, there's an emphasis on, Harmony and balance and, you know, the interconnectedness of all things. Mm. You're not one. We're all connected. We're all connected. And that's reflected in this equilibrium where they balance, you know, um, so many things. Even in the narrative structure of the way they do their films, there's, you know, the character dynamics, the visual composition. There's huge balance. And some of these films have, uh, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, it influenced so much of uh, martial arts, right? For example, The Matrix, the choreography was done by Wu Ping, right? He was the guy that did Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which was that style of just being on the wires. You see it now everywhere, mm. right? And that is the depth of China that drew me to the culture in the very beginning. Mm. And, and seeing the great impact that it's had on you as someone who's balanced between the East and the Western culture. And you've taken all the positives you can from Chinese culture and it's impacted you in a much more positive way. And for me as well, like it, it's impacted me in a positive way, having that balance of different cultures and, and experiencing different ways of life and the best directors mm. and the best actors. I hear them in interviews talk about, they watch Korean films, they watch Italian films. They'll take in, um, different ideas and different stories from different people and allow that to, to get in their work. But I find with audiences, it's different. And I think there's a, a thing in America, England, Australia, a lot of Western countries where the audience is much more shut off from receiving films from other countries. 
uh, rather right. the, the best directors that the audience loves, they're not shut off. And the reason why they're so good is because they get those perspectives from other people. But the audiences I find aren't willing to accept perspectives from others. So when it comes to film and Chinese culture, what, because I feel like there are people listening to this talk who maybe don't even watch other country movies, right? They don't watch Chinese films. What are the best bits, the best elements from Chinese storytelling, Chinese culture that you can, that you can share here that, uh, that you think people can take a lot from and reasons why they should watch Chinese film and watch films from other cu- cultures? I'll give you an example. Um, so many cultures, so, so, so much film in Chinese, like so many Chinese films have influenced Western culture. I'll give you an example. And in terms of them working together, the balance of East and West, Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris. Okay. And once that happened, you know, Chuck Norris, just everyone knows, most everyone knows Chuck Norris. Okay. <laughs> and I remember a lot of people talk about the first fight between Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. And then you had greats after that, such as Jet Li, Jet Li and Jason Statham, right? And they were like, wow. And I remember the director and people were talking to me about it. And then everyone went, Wu Jing and Tony <laughs> fighting. And I just went, wow. And then in that process, first I was very humbled, very, very humbled for that moment. And as the process starts to begin, I realized when I was open to learning in Chinese culture, I learned so much more. And it's all reflected in the film that such as, um, the principles that I learned from the Tao, I'll give you an example, um, balance and harmony, right? The importance that, um, you need to embrace the yin and the yang, understand the opposites, not just see one thing and that they all coexist. What do I mean by coexist? There's, there's the good doesn't work without the bad, right? What is a good man, but a bad man's teacher? And what is a bad man, but a good man's job, right? They all coexist in the film. Wu Jing, you know, he's fighting for the person he loves. Well, I'm also fighting for something I love, right? And, you know, there was an article that Cambridge did where they really understood that you play the bad guy, but he's a bad guy with good intentions. My intention in the film was to fight for freedom of choice to fight for, you know, a natural intelligence. I don't believe in AI. I don't want AI to control me. Right. So, you know, um, there's, there's that balance and harmony, seeing the opposites and then being present. That's super important that letting go of regrets, the past and just immersing yourself in this present moment is something I learned in China. I do it in Qigong. I do it in Tai Chi. I do it in the martial arts. And as an actor, if you're not present on set, reacting to everyone moment to moment, moment to moment, it's not real. Mm. It's not real. And then all these values in China go deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper in my heart. Now they teach you to live with inner authenticity because the way out is the way in. If your inner heart space is true and authentic, you're living your truest self. You're aligning your thoughts with your words and actions. You see, mm. some people, they're not all aligned. And when it's all aligned, then you're living your truest self, your deepest values. And it's all about, you know, the Tao, living this wisdom of the Tao. It's 81 verses, cultivating wisdom, you know, cultivating your virtues and going above ego, not thinking about self. And the wandering earth too, and the first one as well, it's all about that. It's not about me. It's all going to come together. Let's solve this problem. Uh, we all know the Marvel movies, different films. Mm. Um, it's really like one perspective. It's the Western perspective. Yeah. But there's a whole genre in China, in Middle East, in Africa. They're all telling beautiful stories. And when I go there, I'm so humble to say, well, I've never seen this world. But here's the thing. I realize becoming more of a global citizen this global identity that we talked about that, Mm. you know, the more the world that you have, the more you see what you don't see. Right. And, and you meet people that can, you know, one person can change your whole thought process, change your whole direction. Mm. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, just here at Harvard business school, we learned 
um, from a group of people from all around the world about aligning three things, authenticity, logic, and empathy. Maybe you could do one, but if you line them all together, things move really well. Mm. And I, I, sat, I sat there thinking to myself, that's China. Those are the things I learned in China, which is recognizing the interconnectedness of authenticity, logic, and empathy. And then, you know, letting go of my ego or any ego that I have, and then just having a greater sense for this moment and experiencing it. And if you can bring that to film, which I learned from all these great actors, it just makes it magic. Mm. And, and something you're touching on here, which it keeps making me think about AI and natural intelligence is the way you're talking about balancing yourself, being truthful, having values, uh, faith in a higher purpose. All that we're talking about here, there's, we're living in a weird time in, in the world where the, you know, chat GPT and you've got AI coming up and writers in Hollywood are going on strike because there might be, uh, AI writing for films. We're also seeing actors who are, who have been dead 50 years that are coming back on screen by using AI. What are your takes on this when it comes to storytelling? So don't let AI use you and everyone, when you start focusing on it and that's all you see, I think that's what it becomes. It becomes all AI when the focus should be shifted to what can a machine not do? What's natural intelligence? The first question I ask is my highest value, love, put it into chat GPT. It says, yeah, well, love describes this, 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 but I don't feel it. It's not feeling, right? It's, it, you're not, maybe some people, I don't know, you're not going to build a relationship through chat GPT. I like a real, genuine relationship. Yes, you can bring people back, but at the end of the day, you're not living moment to moment. You're not here right now. And I always tell people with kids and children that presence is powerful, being in the present moment. And kids don't need presence. They need our presence. They need to be here right now. That is a natural intelligence that, excuse me, is an intelligence based around love. What you're saying here, it's making me think back to a, a quote from Joaquin Phoenix, who I think is easily one of the greatest actors from the modern day and possibly from the history of film. And he said, he hates this thing that people talk about, know your character. And this is making me think about AI because they bring back actors and they say, oh yeah, well, we use technology to know how they act. And so we can give the exact same performance as if they were alive. And Joaquin Phoenix said, I hate this idea of knowing your character because I don't know what I'm going to do half the time. I might be walking down the stairs and I'll just randomly jump and do some twirl or something like he goes, you'll just randomly do things and you won't know why you did it. And he goes, so knowing your character can sometimes hurt your performance. And so this makes me think about AI with film is that you're not going to get those spontaneous moments that only, you know, Bruce Willis could have done or only James Dean could have done or whoever the actor is you're bringing back on screen. You're not going to get those moments yeah. that only they could think about without even thinking about, if that makes sense. And so what- That makes perfect sense. Yeah. 100%. Here's how, here, because one of the things I want to do is try and take the complicated, which we learn, you know, um, make it all complicated and just make it very simple. Let's go with natural intelligence. What's natural? Being born. That's natural. Okay. Every single person is different, but we're all made to think we're the same. No, we're different. There's not, there's not another Jesse in the world. There's another Tony in the world. And no matter how many avatars or whatever you create, they'll never exactly be like you. So own who you are. And this is why I love coaching in the beginning. That's why I love working with you. And I'm so proud to see who you are because when you know who you are, no one can copy it. But if you try and be like everyone else and follow all the same systems, and of course the world has to work and you have to be part of the education, go through things and learn and memorize. But you have to stick with the natural intelligence of knowing who you are, not getting lost in something else and allowing someone to define you. And then with knowing who you are, that's aligning your values, digging deep, working on your purpose, getting educated. I'm a big believer in getting people to school, asking the tough questions. You get back to a natural intelligence. You get back to 
being in the moment, being you and being truthful. But if you rely on chat GPT and it's funny, I see people do this a lot. They bring chat into everything. It's fake. It just doesn't feel real. Even in the writing world, maybe yes, chat can write scripts and it's, it's changing the world and for people, but the true essence, it's very hard for a machine to capture that. For example, if we're talking about AI, the people that do the deep fakes in film and creating, recreating people that passed away, the eye alignment is slightly off. It mm. doesn't look real. There's, 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 a, there's a fakeness to it. And I found the best things in life are all built around love. They're all built in the moment. No matter how much money you have, you know, some people say, yeah, but you know, you just don't know where to shop. Not true. Right. It's, it's, it's not, it's not true because that's only for a moment. But if you want something to last a lot longer, it's built around love. It's built around a natural intelligence. And if we focus on that, things work. But if you focus on, um, not being natural and chat GPT, it doesn't last. Yeah. And it's like, a, sorry, I had some, I had some people come by just saying, Hey, Tony, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's actually one, I wanted to finish on this point about natural intelligence. Um, we should, if you just focus your questions around, how can I be natural? How can I be at this moment? Then it's really authentic. And it comes back to what you said with those actors, you know, because the thing about chat GPT, it doesn't make mistakes. Human beings make mistakes. It's still making mistakes that it's natural. Some of the funniest things that happen on set, <laughs> on set will just nat just naturally happen. I'll give you an example of our film, The Wandering Earth 2. And it ties back to something natural I felt in my heart when I was a little boy. I used to pick up everything and say, where is this made? It's made in China. I asked people, what does it mean made in China? What does this mean? And people would say, uh, I don't know, right? <laughs> it's the whole knowing about and knowing people say oh that's china it's over there and i said yeah but um what does that mean and 18 years later i have an understanding i have an appreciation for it and in the film wondering Earth too when i get knocked again with that and it spins around with that ring as i said it yeah. says made in china that natural intelligence chat gpt can put that up no. right and it's it's living in that moment and going back and saying what were the things I love? What were the things that made me me? And understand that we're all different. We're not the same. We are not the same. This is why I love coaching because no two people are alike. And I had to really sit down and think about it. And film is exactly the same. Film is 100% the same, like digging deep. Even here, as I sit on these, stand on these hallowed grounds of Harvard or Cambridge, I am constantly amazed at all the people I meet, at all the different stories, all the amazing, each person has their own hero's journey. And when I dig deep down and get to know them, I'm like, chat GPT could never do that. It couldn't tell me Jesse's story. Mm. It couldn't tell me the story that people listen to this podcast. That's natural intelligence. And I think somehow we're just being so pulled away from it. I even see it at school where people use chat GPT. Don't use it. Go deep in yourself and try you know, work on it. And I've seen people, um, I've heard, I've heard people talk about AI being used to write scripts. This doesn't, doesn't have that substance to it, you know? No. Um, and I'm, I'm a gym guy. I don't think chat's going to help me be able to deadlift more, squat more. <laughs> <laughs> I got, it could tell me what nutrition to take and everything, but I got to listen to myself. I got to know what's working. That's based on my education. That's based on natural intelligence and, you know, um, you do need to be aware of AI. I do think people, this is a very important topic. It was what was, I don't want to give too many spoilers away for Wandering Earth 2, but it was a big topic at the end of the film. Mm. And it was, it was one of the things that drove my character because me, my intent was based on my, uh, my intent was based on natural intelligence and all my behavior as my character was based on fighting for a natural intelligence, fighting for what, for what I love mm. and just showing that impact. And that led to a great performance between Wujing and I fighting on set. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a strange time in the world. There's a lot happening, you know, and I, I see, um, yeah, I think one of the things we talked about, we talked about a lot going back to the love letter 
for the genres and film that capturing that authenticity chat doesn't do it for me it may be able to bring together the classics but the storytelling and a way a director shoots like a james cameron or a steven spielberg and then their understanding of emotional connections of bringing the characters together that complexity and the layers as we're going through this podcast very hard for chat to do that and yeah. for it to feel real yeah you know this conversation we're having here and i wrote notes out and i said okay let's just go and see where it takes us because um after our first one some people were asking many questions right not chat natural and question natural questions that said you know how did you get there like what were the decisions you made um and so that's why we've kind of gone like to many different areas on different levels mm. um yeah you know chat doesn't have any values what, what i got a great quote from someone in egypt who said you may love your machine but your machine does not love you yeah right that is <laughs> that's so, so true. true yeah you may love your machine but your machine does not love you and and one thing as well with writing is there's uh, a quote from Tarantino where he said he learned to write from acting. He went to acting school and he said he went on into the play one day, but on his way to driving to do the play, he ran over a dog by accident. And he said he did the whole play with this real sadness because he just ran over a dog and he felt really bad. And so he took that into his writing. Whatever happens that day, he's got to put that into his script. He's got to find a way to put that in because that is going to be the most real part of him that he's getting across. And ChatGPT is not going to do that because it's going to take, this is how you write a script. This is the formula. Basically like what you get in school, if you went to like a screenwriting school, you know, this is how you write, but you also have to put in your vision. You have to put in what your life has brought you that no one else could know. And you've touched on this, but I found that so interesting. The way he described what makes a good writer is just the complete opposite of what chat GPT can do. Exactly. And, you know, maybe you can use chat GPT to help you, maybe get you direction and structure, but it's not going to build that feeling. One of the things I learned with Larry Moss, when he, and he inspired me because I saw how he worked with Leonardo DiCaprio in The Aviator, is that when I live moment to moment in my scenes, whether it's on film or in you know, what we do at live plays, uh, whether it's reading Shakespeare or, or any film script, what's the feeling? What are you feeling? What are you, what are you trying to get? What is the emotion that's driving you? And chat is not going to help you. And, and on a personal level for me, where I really feel this is with the Royal Marines and the Marine Corps or any military unit, it is the camaraderie. It is the teamwork. It is the bonds of it's, it's it's the bonds that you have together that are unparalleled to other relationships that cannot be found through chat gpt that is a natural intelligence that is something that's built up over time such as the friendship you and i have watching you grow and holding to those feelings and understanding what they are with your values and quentin tarantino is a master at that i mean if you look at all his films he really understands how to capture feelings yeah. Right. And I find and I think, that's all uh, he knows himself. Oh, I, I find it's like his style is so unique because he just knows himself so well. And that's why he can deliver and those truthful moments. The key point is that he is a leader, a leader on the inside and the outside. He knows who he is and he leads from who he is and with his work. And it's so unique. And if you watch him in an interview, someone could try and push him off or take him in this direction. No, this is the direction I'm going. Own your decisions. You can only really own your decisions if you know who you are. And if you know who you are, it's built from values. And values come when you start doing the deep work, when you shed the skin, when you say, what do I need to do better? And then start doing it. Most people can't even do it, which is why I love, I just love the Tao, the 81 verses I talked about, which were quite deep. The very first, the most, one of the most profound ones that everyone knows is a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Mm. I'll give you an example. It's taken me, I was in Egypt and someone said to me, it's very easy for you to be at Harvard and Cambridge and just be telling your story. We don't all get to go there. And I said to, I said to this person, I said, no, that took me 18 years to get there. That's after I was 17. When I went to China, I had nothing, zero, but I had a dream. I had a vision. 
And all I need to do was take one step towards it. Mm. Don't stand in place, right? Just take the step. And even when you make a mistake, that's okay. Remember what I said? Everything is enlightened trial and error that sticks. Mm. Okay, this works. Now, nah, this don't work. Okay, this works. Let's try that. And then by that process, you start working your values. But that's why you need a system. And these guys, with Quentin Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, James Cameron, Steven Spielberg, masters. Yeah. These are guys who know who they are. They understand the power of intent, their behavior, and impact they have on giving out great performances on film and the impact those films have on changing the world. Mm. And that's where, you know, that's where I'm coming from now with the work that I want to do. It's one of the reasons why I'm here at Harvard. One of the reasons at Cambridge is that you grow through education, you grow through seeing more that global view that we talked about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very powerful. And, and something that I guess ties into all of this is, uh, you talked about it earlier, but I want to dive in deeper. Your your gut, your head, and your heart, right? So you you say mm-hmm. lead with your heart, lead with lead with your gut, but also use your head, but don't lead with your head. So dive into right. that deeper for me with all the work you're doing at Harvard, going into the film industry, and it's all tied around your purpose, your gut and heart, which is to bring uh, uh, balance and health to people's lives. So yeah, it, it, elaborate on that more. Okay. Okay, so we've already talked about values. I'm going to break it down very simple. When it comes to my gut, if I have to convince myself to do something, I'm going to ask you, is that a yes or a no? If I have to convince myself to do it, a 100% no. Exactly. You already know this, right? So whenever I'm convincing myself to do something, it's that swimming upstream. It's that flowing. It's, it's, it's not flowing. It's you, you, you're constantly swimming upstream when actually, you know, it comes down to from my gut, it's like, am I, is my, if I'm in water and I allow my hand just to flow, I become with the water. But the minute I try to grab the water, I grab nothing. Right. And it's that just chasing. It's that I have to, it's that convincing myself. That is my gut saying, no, I shouldn't be doing this. And as I've, you know, as I'm still developing, I've still got a lot more developing to do. The skills, the creativity, the experience all hone that gut feeling that anyone points me in a direction. I've been offered lots of different films. I'm like, no, that's not for me. I'm not into, uh, you know, lots of killing, lots of harm, going down this kind of crazy story. That's not a love letter to the genre. So I don't want to do it. I just know that in my gut. And then I live from a place where, you know, when you live in gratitude, and to get to gratitude, it comes back to the hop ono I told you, told you about, which is, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. When I live in that place of gratitude and feeling blessed and that I have love in my life, that I have love in all areas of my life. And this is not me saying, you know, oh, it's all, you know, I'm in the stars and love. No, I'm just saying like, I love what I do and I feel the love and I feel the gratefulness. I feel this sense of fearlessness. Like I just, I'm, I, I, my, my gut saying, yeah, just go for it. Just do it. Mm, go for it. Yes, I feel it. Then I feel limitless. Yeah. I feel I can do anything. And that, you know, when we were talking, I was at Cambridge till late at night. And then today was Sunday, Harvard campus. Everyone's getting great, great, ready for the graduation MBA. Most people have gone out. I've said, no, I'm doing my, I'm doing <laughs> this podcast right now on the graduation ground. Everyone's walking by. What's going on? I said, I'm doing a podcast. Why? Because I'm keeping a commitment, a gut level feeling where it's like, this is what I want to do. Mm. This feels right. And gut also ties into what we touched on before, which is four agreements. Very simple. Keep your word. Is this word feel right based on, based on? my values. Okay. Yes. I kept my word. I don't make any assumptions. I don't take anything personally. I do my best. If I could bring all those together in that moment, gut feels right. Now you ask about the heart, right? You know, there are many ways you can get touched with your heart. Sometimes you put my hand on my heart and I just take a deep breath and I'm like, does this feel right? It's just a yes or a no. Yes. This feels right. Go that direction. And I know because I have this, this feeling that feels right. I had it when I got accepted to Harvard. I had it when I was on the base with all my friends in the Marine Corps. Like my heart just felt right. 
when it hasn't felt right is when things are just not worked out, right? Maybe, um, I think actually, maybe a good example. Um, oh yeah, being offered scripts that never just felt right to me. I said in my heart, this, this is, a, you know, I don't want to play like a, a guy who's just doing really nothing in the film. He's just there, just a big bodyguard standing strong, looking good. I said, that's not me. That's not a love letter. And now when we talk about the headpiece, this is why I come to Cambridge. This is why I come to Harvard and particularly Harvard Business School because I like to focus around business and the Marine Corps is that it structures my analytical thinking to break things down and to say, okay, what are the steps you need to do? How does that work? How does that look from a micro perspective and a macro perspective? For example, I like to build businesses. I had a protein bar business. That means I need to write out a financial plan. How does that look? And then when I've done the financial plan, there's a marketing plan. There's a strategic positioning. There's the capabilities. How does the team work? So many complex moving parts and some great things. You know, I'm always learning even here at Harvard. This is the headpiece that there's, um, you know, there's a strategic, there's a strategic positioning. There's what's the value? What's the impact? Uh, what's your vision? What's your purpose? How are you going to adapt to changing markets, innovation? All of this is analytical thinking. If you can bring that together in a cohesive strategy and now test it with gut, does this feel right? Test it with your heart. Now I'm in the right direction. Mm. Now this holy trinity of gut, head and heart feels right. Gut, head and heart lines up with what? I've been authentic. I'm having logic and I have an empathy. Right. Remember that triangle I said mm. you got authenticity, logic, empathy. I try to look at everything as a holy trinity. Gut, head, heart comes together. Yeah. Right. And then you have things like intent, behavior, impact. Make sure they're all aligned. Because when one thing's out, it shows up. It's so interesting because anytime I've not been there with my gut or head, even when we were shooting scenes on Wandering Earth 2, I remember in a certain take, it didn't work so well. And then problem. Mm. right and then i was like oh my gosh that's because there was no alignment you know what i mean yeah and can i just say that is the making of a great actor because in my opinion my favorite actors are the ones who stay true to who they are right they're not going to take a movie because it's a movie they're going to take it because they see how that aligns with their values their mission their purpose and they're not saying that those are bad movies they just don't think it aligns with them and it might align with someone else. And that ends up making that movie better because if they were in it, they would make it worse. And so my favorite actors are the ones who say no to probably more movies than they say yes to <clears throat> because most of them don't align with themselves. And um, I think that's just so important and it shows such strength and staying true to your values. And that's something that I think we definitely need more of because I feel like there's just a lot of circumstances where there are certain actors in a movie where probably another actor would be better but one actor just took it because it was a movie. I find that. So I think the best actors are the ones who stay true to themselves. You know, this is why I love the Marine Corps. It's not about just only the rich history and the tradition. Is that those opportunities of personal growth, professional growth, is structured around this area where they build leadership in achieving your goals, but also that there's this commitment to service, sacrifice, to contribute beyond yourself to something meaningful, to something greater than yourself. And once you start to get all those pieces together, that really is gut, head, and heart. And if you're in a unit with the guys and your gut and head and heart are not aligned and you have issues, they'll show up and it won't work. And then they'll say, you know what? We don't want to be part of this team. And as I'm starting to grow, I realize that the people that come together with me in terms of my team are all those people that align up on gut, head, and heart. Mm. Right? And, you know, it's a process. And that comes back to also, you've got to get around the right people. You've got to be around proximity is power, being next to the right people. And it's also this sense of osmosis, that that transfer of energy transfers to you. So you've got to be around the right people. Because if you're around the wrong people, it will have an effect. So that's why I pick a Tony Robbins. I pick a Keanu Reeves, pick being at Harvard Business School, Cambridge, the Marines, the environment, right? We talk about nature versus 
uh, nurture, right? And, you know, I think it's, I think it's a combination of many. Um, but you really need to put yourself in the right place where all those things can start to align. Because if you have the wrong, if the wrong people, which I call warnings and not role models, it can have an impact. So therefore find the role models that can guide your head, heart and gut and just check it. Just ask the question. Is this person in the moment helping me achieve my gut level understanding, heart and head? If not, find something else. The world's a big place. You don't need to be with, you know, just one person, one thing, one system. Yeah. And, uh, that's something that you actually taught me. I have to say from a young age, you taught me that. And, and I find yeah. the times like I've even had friends say to me, Oh, like you're so quick to like not be friends. Like I'm not mean to anybody, but they always say to me, like, you know, you keep a small circle, but you're friendly with everyone. But the ones that you, you are like genuinely talk to on a personal level, you keep quite small and close. And that's because you actually taught me and my parents that the power of, knowing that people are a positive influence yeah. on your life, you know? And, and exactly. so I would rather no friends if I was in an environment where no one would be positive on my life. But I'm luckily enough, there are a few people who are, but I would rather be alone with no negative impacts than with a bunch of friends mm. who are all negative impacts. Exactly. And it's these people that have the principles and values that guide you, right? So yes, I impact a lot of people through film, through social media, it's this, this breadth. But what I found, especially from Harvard Business School here, we have a living group of people that you live with. It reminds me of the Marine Corps that we are going deep. We're going on depth, not breadth, but depth. And that depth with people, you know, gives an understanding to you, allows you to see what you're not seeing. And you have the connection. You can't build love on the surface level. That is a process of going deep, deep and deeper. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Once, uh, one of my coaches told me whenever I was going through a tough period of time, um, he told me a story of King Solomon that had a ring. And on the inside of the ring, it said, this too shall pass, right? This too shall pass. Whatever you're going through, it always remember this too shall pass. So I got my ring from uh, Harvard today. And uh, on the inside of the inscription, I say, this too shall pass. So whatever you're going through, that's, I just move the ring around and I say, this too shall pass. Because um, as we know, there have been a lot of trouble times in the past and recently as well in the world. And, you know, if you stay in that moment of fight and flight, it can you can lose yourself. But if you have a, a better vision to look to, a little saying, something that was brought on by good people around you, it can hold you in the present moment with a positive mindset, which is this too shall pass. And that's why... You know, I wear this ring and I move it around my hand and I say to myself, you know what? This too shall pass. Mm. That's a that's a great place, I think, to to wrap up this conversation. It was a great episode. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, it was a, a really good, in-depth conversation and we related it back to film and storytelling in such a unique way. And I also have to say to end this episode that you embody exactly what I want this podcast to be about. So the reason why I started this podcast is because I want to go in depth on stories and how they can impact your life, both in positive right. and negative, and how you can take lessons from stories because they're the best teacher to, to improve your life. And you're someone who embodies someone who takes lessons from stories and every, everywhere in the world and, and embodies that perfectly to improve your own life and then use your lessons to then use storytelling to teach others. I think it's just perfect. And you are exactly and, what this podcast is about. So thank you. And, and Jesse, I'm so happy to do this. And to sum it all up, you know, I would say, you know, go out there in the world, find your role models, ask great questions, right? Don't look for the answers, look for great questions. See the skin you can shed. What can you do better? Start doing it. And then like with myself or anyone in light and trial and error, whatever mistake you make, and say, okay, this works, this doesn't, work out your values, follow your gut, your head and heart, and everyone will be as amazing as you, brother. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me, bro.